Welcome back to Applied Materials and Corrosion. Today we're going to look at the barrier properties of polymers or whatever else we might have. So if we think of it in this case we've got some molecules on this side, we've got our barrier whatever it is there, and then we've got not very much concentration of the same thing on the other side. So it's behaving like some kind of membrane. If we want to simplify it to a case that we understand, so if we remember our organic chemistry from the second semester, we made some tertiary butyl chloride and it was in water. And what we did was we added salt to the water. We also took a lot of the water away, but we added salt to the water. We put some oil on top and we extracted the tertiary butyl chloride into the water, into the oil phase. So we wanted to get it out of the oil, out of the water, and then to dry it. In this case, we had uh, very little other things, but we could extract it into the oil, and then we could run the water out. So we've got something that is soluble in both water and oil, but when we mix them together, it moves, it partitions, as we say preferentially into the oil. There's still some in the water. We sacrifice a little bit and it gets lost. So how does this relate? Well, if we had our tertiary butyl chloride here in an organic solvent oil, and we had a thin layer of water and we had some more oil over here, it could go through the water as long as it's slightly soluble. So it goes from the oil phase into the water phase and back into the oil phase. Obviously, because the water can move, it will be, we can shake it. In a barrier case, we have a layer which isn't moving because it's a polymer or it's an oxide, some kind of solid. And then we have to dissolve our chemical into the barrier. It has to transfer through and then it comes back out again. So we have two processes where there is there would be an equilibrium if we waited long enough, but typically we don't. So we've got our chemical of interest going into the barrier. That's a dissolution process and it's coming back out again, but it can also do the same thing on the other side. Um, let me draw it the same size because who knows? So our molecule is going into the barrier and it's coming back out again on this side and it's going in and it's coming out again so we need to define a few things so you'll have heard of diffusion from somebody else if we have diffusion through the solid we can imagine there's a constant concentration here there's a constant concentration here it's coming in fast from this liquid or gas whatever this is and it's being taken away fast by this liquid or gas, whatever it is. And therefore we have a constant flow. J is the flux, that's a fixed diffusion law. But in this case, we've only got one dimension through it because it's sort of effectively infinite in this direction and in this direction. So that makes it that simple. It's just related to the diffusion coefficient and the changing concentration. This is related to concentration and uh, per distance. So the higher concentration change over a smaller distance, the faster the diffusion. And the higher the concentration, uh, the higher the diffusion coefficient, the higher the diffusion. The higher the diffusion coefficient, the higher the diffusion. So if we consider the case of a polymer with water, for example, trying to diffuse through it, the solubility of water inside our polymer is very low. So although the concentration of water on one side is high, it can only dissolve into the polymer at a low concentration. So the concentration gradient across the polymer is comparatively small. That's the driving force for the diffusion through the polymer. That's why we can get away with a very thin layer of polymer and it will diffuse through very slowly. But note, if there is any solubility at all inside the polymer, it will get through. If there's any possibility of the material to get through, to dissolve into 
a solid, it will get through. So this would be the concentration of water in water. Inside the polymer it's very low compared to in the water, but uh, its concentration gradient is what drives it through, and in the air it's lower, so it can be extracted, but the amount and the concentration are not the same thing. So if we have pure water, it's a very high amount of water. But if we have air at 100% humidity, although it's got a lot less water in it per unit volume, it is still saturated with water. It's still got as much water in it as possible. It has the same water potential as liquid water. Air that's saturated with water is in equilibrium with water liquid. So although the amount is different, it's the saturation amount compared to the amount that's there that drives it. And in this case, there's very little inside our polymer, but that's because it is held down by the solubility, even though it's probably maximum here and it's, yeah, it's trying to escape here, so it's lower. We will be getting water through our polymer, but in this case, the rate is comparatively low. So we need to look at what D is, because unless D is zero, we will get transfer of material from one side to the other. Unless D is zero, we will get transfer of material from one side to the other. So where are they hiding? Remembering our Gibbs free energy equation, the Gibbs free energy that tells us whether something will happen is dependent on the heat of interaction minus the temperature multiplied by the change in entropy. If we take this for example, this is water that's organized and it's got a hole in it because the water is now organized in a bonded structure and it has a hole in it where something else can go in. In the other way around, our polymers are gain in entropy by being less crystallized. So we have crystalline domains, but between them we have non-crystalline regions and they are moving slightly, they're more random. And because they're more random, they don't fit properly. So there are spaces in between where things can go. If we add another molecule to it, it can squeeze in between the polymer chains and change the structure. So if we take something like polypropylene and we take toluene, it's not soluble in the toluene, but toluene molecules go in between the polymer chains and cause it to swell. And we can measure that. It gets heavier, but it also gets bigger. The toluene gets in between the chains and allows them to vibrate slightly, which gives them a bit more freedom of movement, which means it's allowable, particularly at higher temperatures. And then we get more out. In water, it's possibly the other way around, that at low temperatures, where the bonding dominates, we can bond into a cage structure and leave a hole for other molecules to get in. That's what happens under the sea, where natural gas is stored in this structure of water, not obviously that exact one, I just made that up, but it's stored in cages of water, but only at low temperature, because at high temperature, breaking the order is going to dominate. So we can have two possible mechanisms. One is formation of order that generates a hole, and one is formation of disorder that generates a hole, but in both cases we've got space for a foreign molecule to get in between. It will either interact or it won't. So a toluene molecule, for example, will interact with the polymer, so we get a little bit of energy out. A gas molecule will not interact with water as well, but there are no hydrogen bonds pointing into a hole, so it doesn't cost very much to put it in there. To a hole, so it doesn't cost very much to put it in there. To put it in there. Likewise, in an idealized crystal structure of a semiconductor or an insulator, metal oxide, for example, it is 
thermodynamically advantageous at high temperature to have an error in here because it's not so ordered. So it is thermodynamically advantageous to put an interstitial in here or to have a missing oxygen atom and the number of them are determined by the Gibbs free energy equation. We can calculate exactly how many we would expect at any given temperature. As we increase the temperature, the number of them increases. So if we take, for example, a metal with an oxide layer on the surface that is trying to oxidize, the metal ions can diffuse through our oxide layer as extra atoms or the oxygen can diffuse through in the other direction which is the dominant mechanism determines whether it grows on the outside out or the inside in so some metals like zirconium for example if we take a bar of zirconium and we oxidize it we discover at the end that there is a cavity in the middle because the metal predominantly moves outwards if we take other materials, the, the oxygen predominantly moves inwards, and so that we don't get that. In solids, the diffusion coefficient behaves very much like an Arrhenius equation that we'll also know from thermodynamics. So the diffusion coefficient goes up with the exponential of the activation energy divided by RT, so the energy that's available at the temperature that we're given. And if we imagine all of those states, it means that it's the energy that's required to shift around inside the material. You may be familiar with diffusion in liquids, in which case the viscosity of the liquid is what's causing this resistance. But in a solid, it's got to actually break a bond and move. And so that gives us an activation energy that requires it to have to jump to the next site. And obviously it will do it, but the amount of times per unit time that it does it is dependent on the ratio between the temperature and the activation energy to move. So this is the common in semiconductors, in oxides. It's also common in polymers that as we heat it up, the rate of diffusion will go up exponentially, and that will allow us to get more through our material if we want to or if we don't want to it will still cause more more stuff to diffuse through our material the two handles that we have are the diffusion coefficient inside it or the activation energy inside and the solubility constant so the less soluble the gas or liquid or solute is in our barrier the lower our concentration gradient can be and the lower the or the higher the activation energy the slower the diffusion is and so we have two factors in there from fixed diffusion equation they're both in there and they will cause it to be changeable you may be familiar with this effect from other things but let's look at it here if we've got a polymer and parts of it are crystalline and parts of it are non-crystalline, the foreign atom, in this case water or oxygen, typically are what we want to avoid going through our polymer, they will be able to travel either through the grains or through the grain boundaries. In the grains we have in a polymer typically crystalline material. Inside the boundaries there's less crystalline material, so there's more space things to get through. If this was stainless steel, for example, we could consider the chromium, which is going to protect our surface against oxidation. The chromium can diffuse faster in the grain boundaries of chromium than it can through the grains of the crystal. So we get a, effectively a mixture of travel through the grains, which is slow, or travel through the grain boundaries, which is usually faster. Not always, but usually faster. In the case of stainless steel, there is an advantage to be had to make the grain structure smaller so that the diffusion is faster or to have less crystallinity. So the diffusion is faster, so we get no chromium to the outside. In the case of polymers, if they're doing a barrier job, then 
there is a case to be had for having more crystalline structure although then it will become typically less e less flexible in fact the oxygen barrier properties of polymers are very difficult to make very high because oxygen is not very polar it can diffuse through most things it's quite small and therefore um, to prevent oxygen from getting through we normally use a layer of aluminium because the um, the activation energy of going through aluminium oxide for the oxygen is quite high that would make it very difficult for the oxygen to get through the aluminium oxide layer if there is aluminium metal still there it will react immediately with the metal once it gets there so it will first of all have to get rid of the aluminium layer and that is a typical way of protecting things from oxygen a polymer coated with a very thin layer of aluminium oxide because the solubility of oxygen in aluminium oxide is very low there aren't that many errors in the aluminium oxide so there's a very low concentration inside and the activation energy for it to move around inside is very high so it's quite difficult to get it to move through particularly at normal temperatures at higher temperatures it becomes easier one of the interesting cases of this is the lambda sonde in your car which measures oxygen concentration by a simple oxygen cell so it measures the um, Nernst potential of oxygen against the Nernst potential of oxygen inside the exhaust and outside the exhaust so it references atmospheric oxygen to the burnt oxygen and the voltage that it gives out tells your car whether to put more oxygen in or less the interesting thing about it is the fuel cell uses the, the diffusion of oxygen through a ceramic material and it diffuses through fast enough to generate enough current that we can measure the voltage it's not a lot of current but it's enough to measure a stable voltage through a solid of ceramic now we can go back and consider a simple ceramic so we've got some aluminium it's in contact with some water that's saturated with oxygen because it's in the air and the aluminium can take oxygen from the air and react to form aluminium dioxide that's okay sorry uh, al 203 it can react it can, it's completely satisfied but what happens how can it block it there's another driving force so the, first of all we have the diffusion which can prevent it and then we still have a mismatch we have a thermodynamic problem because the E naught here is the electrode potential of aluminium and the E naught here is the electrode potential of water in contact with oxygen so there must be a drop in potential across our oxide layer there must be a drop in electrode potential across our oxide layer otherwise something must happen if there's a drop in potential across our oxide layer that tells us that it's behaving like a resistor so this is now a resistor the electrode is a resistive component or the electrode the oxide layer is a resistive component in a circuit that we could make what happens if we now try to do something to it by applying an electrical potential so if we try to make this more positive that will push this up to here now let me draw it in a different color that will push our electrode potential up to this blue place so our aluminium is now more oxidizing it's trying to lose electrons more to become al2 plus uh, 3 plus um, that can do two things it can either drop but it can't change the potential down here so then what tends to happen is the oxide layer then gets thicker because the resistivity of aluminium dioxide aluminium oxide is constant so then we have to make it thicker so that 
the same thing happens. So if the resistivity is constant, then the angle of this slope must be constant and we must come to the same place. So the only thing that can possibly happen is our oxide layer gets thicker to allow us to get to here. At this point, the resistivity of the oxide layer is blocking the voltage. And so now we have the same effect as we had before. We've reached a standstill. It's not reacting very fast because of the driving force that we need. So the other way of looking at it, which is also true, is that if we have some oxygen and we form an iron at the surface, so we form an O2 minus iron at the surface, and we have an Al3 plus at the metal interface, then there is a driving force. The electrical potential is now driving them towards each other, and that is the driving force pushing them through the oxide layer against the barrier properties of the oxide layer. So we can play with the electrical driving force by adding a four field here, or we could make our chemical more oxidizing here, more or less oxidizing. If we make it more oxidizing, we pull it down here. If we make it less oxidizing, it will go away in the other direction. And we still have this barrier property, the resistivity of the coating, uh, or in this case, the oxide layer, which prevents it from, well, which allow, stops it from growing any further. So if we want to investigate this, we could do something like this here. We've got an aluminium electrode with aluminium oxide on the surface. We've got some salty water in here. We've got another aluminium electrode to make our thought process simple. And we're going to apply a voltage. If we apply a voltage, some current will flow, but because this is a resistor, it can only flow for a little while because this is very resistive. But like I said, it's a not conductive. It will only flow for a very short time and then it will stop. So all that we're really doing is we're getting some H plus and we're shifting it in our solution to close to the other electrode. So we make this negative. We have some positive charge here and we make this one positive and we have a negative charge here that allows a bit of current to flow. Then the current will stop flowing as long as we don't apply too much voltage. Then we switch it because we've got AC. It goes the other way. So our electric bilayer uh, bi charges up in the other direction. Minus, 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 plus, plus, plus. And so we've got effectively a capacitor that we're charging up and discharging. And it is has a certain size that's dependent on the area of the electrode and the thickness of this oxide layer. If we change the frequency, so we go down to very low frequency, then we will find not very much current flows because at DC, for example, it charges up and then it stops. So what we would expect to see is a characteristic frequency at which current starts to flow, which is dependent on how thick this oxide layer is, how resistant it is. So we can look at these layers with a thing called electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. The spectroscopy is because we're changing the frequency of the AC that we're looking at it with. And we can use that to calculate the value of, effectively, we've got a capacitor and a resistor in series, which are behaving like our uh, components in here. So this is behaving like a capacitor, these two together, and the movement of the ions in the solution is behaving like a resistor. So we can find out what the values of these components are by varying the frequency. We could vary the voltage, but we can't vary it very much because we will cause some electrochemistry to happen. This is a method that we can use to investigate such systems. If we push it too hard, we will cause the layer to grow or shrink. 
but if we push it only a little bit we can measure the value of these components to try to find out a little bit more about what's going on. So that'll be enough for, for, for today. A little bit of diffusion through barrier coatings. They behave like a partition between one solvent and another one and a diffusion barrier so they have to diffuse through and the total rate through depends on the diffusion rate and the activation energy of moving through. If we wait forever they most things will go through. If we wait forever things go through almost everything. So if we have a paint coating on a car and we look at the interface between the car and the paint, between the metal and the paint, we will discover that there is there are water molecules, there are oxygen molecules. It takes a long time for them to get there, but they can get there eventually because there is always a little bit of space between the polymers for them to sneak through and eventually they get there driven by diffusion. They can diffuse away again if nothing happens, but there is always a small concentration of them at that interface. If we want to make a barrier for food, then we have the problem that depending on the polymer, oxygen can diffuse through it quite readily because it's not polar, so it can get through most polymers. Um, other gases sometimes struggle. So oxygen is a medium-sized molecule. It can get through most things. It is quite difficult to prevent oxygen from getting through completely with uh, organic components, although some are better than others. Um, and the best way to prevent it more is to coat it with an inorganic material because the activation energy of movement through it, so the diffusion coefficient, is much more hindrant to the oxygen getting through. Okay, that'll do for one day. Goodbye. Sorry about the one eye. Sorry about the one eye.